Now, if you asked me to name a word that describes the difference between long-term successful investing and long-term unsuccessful investing, that word would be costs. A lot of people underestimate the impact costs have on their total returns. Uh, and maybe that's because they often sound quite low. You know, is there really such a big difference between half a percent a year and one percent a year? Well, actually, there is. So this video is all about why trading costs matter, why you shouldn't just be too apathetic about them, and some practical steps. So what can you do to try and keep those trading costs down and your wealth up? Okay, there are any number of statistics that I could run through to demonstrate that uh, costs matter. And when I say costs, I mean, what are we talking about here? Uh, if you're buying and selling shares, we're talking about potentially tax. So for example, there's stamp duty paid up front at half a percent of the amount you pay. There's uh, potentially then uh, income tax on dividends, capital gains tax on profits. Plus, you've got your bid to offer spreads. That's the gap between the buying and selling price that allows the broker to make a little bit of money on the trade. And of course, you've got any commission on top. Uh, and that could be either a percentage of the amount involved, or it might be a fixed amount. So £9.99 per trade, for example. And all of those add up. Cumulatively, they can have a big impact on your long-term wealth. Okay, a couple of statistics, and then we'll get into how to reduce those costs. Number one, a recent study by Morningstar in the US um, has shown that between 2005 and 2010, the cheapest US funds returned over 1% more per year than the most expensive. And that kind of gap matters, particularly if you're looking at more than five years. For example, um, if you were to put a thousand pounds a year into a fund and leave it to grow at 6%, 30 years later, you'd have around 79,000 pounds thanks to the magic of compounding, i.e. the first pound has 30 years to grow. However, imagine you factor in costs so that now your return has dropped from 6% to just 5% a year for those 30 years. All of a sudden, at the end of 30 years, having invested the same £1,000 per year, 5% growth would only leave you with £66,000. So at 6%, £79,000 over 30 years as a pot. At 5%, just £66,000, give or take. Now that is a pretty sizable difference. So whilst you might be thinking up front, well, 1% a year, who really cares? Actually, over time, that makes one heck of a difference. So, investing isn't just about picking the right investments. Of course it is. It's also about getting them at a sensible price in cost terms. So the question then is what can you do? Um, there are three or four things that every investor should consider to bring those trading costs down. So, number one, shop around. We're very apathetic as investors. Um, basically, we stick with what we know. For example, many of us never change banks. We've been with the same bank for 25 years. I'm guilty of that, actually. And it seems like too much effort to switch, even though we're being ripped off by our current bank and getting crap customer service. Or we stick with the same mobile phone provider because we're comfortable with them when actually we should be changing. Same is true of your broker don't necessarily just stick with the same broker. Check whether you could be getting your deals cheaper elsewhere. Um, for example, are you getting bulk discounts for trading more often? Quite a few brokers will now offer you know, £9.99 on a trade if you're an infrequent trader, but £6.99 if you trade more than, say, six or eight times a month. So do shop around. And we have a video on the website on exactly the how to choose a broker theme. And that's well worth a look. So, shop around, number one. Review who your trades are being placed with, which funds you're into, and make sure charges are competitive. And don't be afraid to switch if they're not. Number two, don't 
over trade. We all get terribly excited. News comes in that a world terrorist leader has been shot or a tsunami's hit Japan or there's been a royal wedding. And the temptation is to react. Now those are big pieces of news. I'm not belittling any of them, but as an investor, you need to be pretty sanguine. You need to sit back and just say, actually, what's the underlying economic impact? And chances are, for a single one-off event, it's zero. Anyone who sold up in the wake, for example, of the Japan disaster, horrendous as that was, regretted it pretty quickly afterwards. Same is true of the financial crisis. Many investors dumped shares and then looked on in horror as they recovered from about March 2009 onwards. Or not in horror, but rather they regretted selling. So, be careful. Every day you're bombarded with uh, newspaper headlines, screenshots showing you what's happening out there in the big wide world, company updates, profit announcements, directors leaving, and it's very tempting, and of course the financial industry encourages it because it makes them more commission, to react, to think I've got to do something. But, um, to borrow a phrase I think first coined by uh, Ronald Reagan when he was president, better than react is not to do anything at all. Yeah, his famous phrase was, uh, don't do something, just stand there. Okay, so, over trading, avoid it. The way to avoid it is to be a little bit rigorous. Say, I'll review my portfolio every quarter, not every half an hour because I've seen something on my terminal at work, and once a quarter, I'll make some decisions about where I'm invested and why. But I'm not going to allow myself to be distracted by what's happening in the next two minutes. Okay, number three would be stick to cheap products. Now, the financial services industry wants you to buy expensive ones, obviously, um, but cheap ones are where really you're going to get the better returns. Um, now, for example, we like exchange traded funds at Money Week. Not all of them, um, but we like the basic plain vanilla ones, are the ones that simply offer to track, say, the performance of the FTSE 100 or the gold price or something similar. We're not into complicated ones, we're not into leveraged ETFs or structured ETFs, um, but a plain vanilla exchange traded fund should be cheap. And by cheap, I mean half a percent per year or less. That's the kind of cost we're looking at. Okay? You'll pay more for unit trusts and you'll pay a lot more for so-called structured products. Uh, and in another video I'll explain why you want to be careful with some of those expensive products um, that brokers and advisors will attempt to sell you. So, where possible, keep it cheap. And finally, don't forget about tax. There are some easy ways to make your investing cheaper, simply by reducing your tax bill. This is not about commissions or bid to offer spreads, this is about simply paying less tax. Now the one you can't do much about is the half a percent you pay as stamp duty up front when you buy shares, and for that matter when you buy a house. Um, however, you can do something about income tax and capital gains tax. So what can you do? Well, for example, number one, make sure you're using your ISA allowance every year. Now we have a video at Money Week on the subject of why you should have an ISA. Everyone ought to use their annual ISA allowance uh, if they're buying shares because that way you can shield a substantial amount every year up to just over £10,000 at the moment from capital gains tax and most of the income tax you suffer on dividends bar the first 10% which is no longer recoverable. So make sure you're using your ISA allowance. Number two, if you lose money on shares you create a capital gains tax loss and that can be used later to reduce future capital gains tax bills. So my advice is if you sell shares at a loss keep a record because who knows five years later when you sell other shares for a profit you can basically offset one against the other and only pay capital gains tax on the difference. So don't take a loss and just forget about it, keep a note of it. It may come in useful later. 
And of course, um, if you fancy completely tax-free investing, but in fairness, with all the risks that come with it, then there are things like spread betting. But that's really more of a short-term opportunity. Uh, Long-term investors, the two key tax breaks are ISAs and also keeping track of any losses. So there we have it. Trading costs matter. Countless studies and statistics show that people who invest at low cost do better on average than people who invest at high cost. And you want to be thinking about all the ways you can bring those trading costs down. I would say that here are four of the easiest and also most effective ones.